Hi there, everyone. Welcome to The Daily Gardener. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's August 8th. John Tabb wrote, A flash of harmless lightning, a mist of rainbow dyes, the burnished sunbeams brightening, from flower to flower he flies. He's talking, of course, about the hummingbird. Gardeners are enthralled by hummingbirds and will do next to anything to attract them to our gardens. One of my happiest memories is being in my garden, working away when I suddenly felt a little displacement of air on my cheek and I turned and found myself staring right at a hummingbird. Pure magic. Hummingbirds find food entirely by sight. If they see red, they zoom in for a closer look. This is why all the hummingbird feeders have that McDonald's red as a prominent feature of the feeder. On the other hand, the liquid in it does not need to be red. Remember that. You can make your own simple nectar by combining one part sugar to four parts water in a saucepan, then make a simple syrup by boiling it down for two minutes. Allow the mixture to cool before you fill your feeders and replace it every couple days. Whatever you do, do not add anything else to your syrup. Don't add red dye. Don't add honey. Both are harmful to hummingbirds. And yes, you may not see them. Hummingbirds are notoriously sneaky. They can feed every 15 minutes without you even knowing, unless you're sitting right there or you happen to have your nest cam trained on your feeder. Finally, hummingbirds love some plants more than others. They're especially fond of honeysuckle. Their favorite flowers have to meet their color criteria, red, red-orange, or pink blossoms. John Audubon called them glittering fragments of the rainbow. Here's today's brevities. Today is the day that the botanist Carl Peter Thunberg died in 1820. Thunberg has been called by many names the father of South African botany and the Japanese Linnaeus. Thunberg had actually been taught by Carl Linnaeus, and Linnaeus encouraged him to continue his work in Paris and Amsterdam. From there, Thunberg joined the Dutch East India Company, and he botanized in South Africa for three years. Next, he traveled to Japan, but before he went, he needed to learn Dutch. The Japanese were not about to convert to Christianity, so they had closed the country off to all European nations except for Holland in order to learn more about medicinal plants. When Thunberg went to Japan, he was posing as a Dutchman instead of a Swede. In fact, during the 18th century, Thunberg was Japan's only European visitor, and his Flora Japonica, published in 1784, was a revelation to botanists around the world. During his time in Japan, Thunberg discovered the Easter lily growing near the city of Nagasaki. He also discovered Forsythia, and he named it in honor of William Forsyth. And today is the birthday of the Canadian botanist Julia Wilmot Henshaw, who was born on this day in 1869. Remembered as one of British Columbia's leading botanists, Henshaw studied for a bit with the botanist Charles Schaefer and his wife. The two were surprised when Henshaw published Mountain Flowers of America in 1906. Rumor had it that the Schaefers may have felt Henshaw had co-opted their work, but another perspective would be that Henshaw was simply more driven and she was definitely an experienced author. In either case, the work needed to be published, and by that time, Henshaw had already written a few books, so she was not slow to publish. In any case, she went on to create two additional volumes on Canadian wildflowers.
Now, Henshaw also had a regular column that was called The Notebook, and it was featured in the Vancouver Sun newspaper, where she was known as Gentle Julia by her fellow journalists. Her weekly column is a delight to read, even today. In April of 1937, she wrote, If I were to tabulate all the proposals put forward as to what should be done with that monstrosity called a fountain in the center of Lost Lagoon, I think it would occupy a whole column in the newspaper. Some want it to be a fountain, illuminated or not, Others want it turned into a rockery. The last column she wrote talked about the destruction of forest areas. Henshaw always wrote with conviction, and in that last column, she aimed to rouse awareness. I refer to the practice which has increased with each passing year of shipping enormous quantities of young Douglas firs by the carload to the United States for use as Christmas trees. Surely this is a matter which should be promptly and preemptorily stopped. And here's a lovely excerpt from her post for this day, August 8th, 1935. When one stops for an instant in the whirligig of life to think of all things bright and beautiful, three words spring into prominence, namely music, children, and gardens, each bringing a separate form of loveliness before our eyes, yet all three correlated in color, fragrance, and form. Love that one. And it's the anniversary of the death of the landscape painter, John Henry Twachtman, who died on this day in 1902. Twachtman was an Impressionist painter known as one of the 10, a group of American Impressionists. It was said they were gardening with a paintbrush. By the middle of the 1880s, American Impressionists were returning home from France At home in America, the gardening movement was well underway. So, when they went looking for things to paint, outside gardens became one of the foremost subjects. In fact, Twachtman is known for featuring flowers from his own garden, as well as painting his family casually living their life outdoors. Twachtman's painting called In the Greenhouse was exhibited by the National Gallery in 1902. And here's a funny story about Twachtman that was shared in the El Paso Herald the same year. A man who once bought one of his paintings wanted Twachtman to weigh in on the hanging of the picture. Twachtman expressed his approval of the background, the height, and the light. He said, Indeed, there is only one change to make. What's that? inquired his host. Twachtman replied, You should hang it the other side up. I always have. In unearthed words, here's a poem from Raymond A. Foss. A break in the heat, away from the front. No thunder, no lightning, just rain. Warm rain, falling near dusk falling on eager ground, steaming blacktop, hungry plants, thirsty, turning toward the clouds, cooling, soothing rain, splashing in sudden puddles, catching in open screens that certain smell of summer rain. Today's book recommendation is Herbs by Judith Hahn. Today's book is one of my favorites. Judith Hahn offers delicious recipes and growing tips to transform your food. And I love the way she starts out talking about herbs in the foreword of her book. She writes, Herbs have taken over my life. They've been catalysts in the kitchen, liberating my cooking by encouraging me to be more creative and they've helped me to become a more serious plants woman using the different shades of green, the texture and shape of the leaves, their intoxicating aroma, and their glorious flowers to transform the look of my garden. 
And did I mention that this book is absolutely beautiful? Because it is. And the photography inspires creativity like crazy. My favorite part of the book are all the anecdotes, along with Han's advice for how to make the most of the herbs in your garden. Today's garden chore is to put the word peonies on your calendar, and you should put peonies on your calendar every day between now and the end of September to remind you that it's a great time to transplant or divide your peonies if they need it. Peonies are best propagated through division, and when you plant a peony, it's important not to bury their eyes. Experienced gardeners will tell you to plant your peony high with the crown no more than an inch or so beneath the soil surface. And remember, peonies no longer have to look like your grandmas did back in the 1920s. The new varieties offer an entirely new range of looks. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. Here's a charming story I ran across from Toonbur's time in Japan. During his visit, Toonbur was confined to a small island in Nagasaki Harbor. Ever the clever end rounder, Toonbur came up with a strategy to get botanical samples. He bought a goat. Then he asked his Japanese assistants to collect plants to feed the goats. Toonbur knew that goats are picky eaters, and it was through the plant material collected for the goat that Toonbur ended up receiving five different specimens of hydrangea previously unknown to the West. These hydrangea would have been the lace caps, the ones that produce the beautiful UFO ring of blooms around the flower head of small florets, and Japan was very private about them. Can you imagine his excitement? The entire time that Toonbur was away, which amounted to an incredible nine-year journey from his native Sweden, Toonbur sent plants and letters to Linnaeus, who in turn said that he had never had more delight and comfort from any other botanist. Hashtag favorite student, hashtag teacher's pet. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener, and remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced weekdays in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. You can find complete show notes over at thedailygardener.org, and be sure to share the show with your garden friends. You can find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest, and of course, Facebook. While you're over at Facebook, don't forget to join The Daily Gardener community. Just search for these three words, Daily Gardener Community. The group will pop right up and then request to join. Finally, I want to thank my team at Podfly Productions, where my fabulous editor is Eric Begay. Have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.